Um, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes and on the subject of learning, well, I, I hope during that 40 minutes you will learn to learn to learn. So, um, and you, hopefully you will also see what this is. This is kind of a faster version of something I did at FOSS Asia, um, but this is definitely a fuller room, so that's good. So, about me. So, if, in case you haven't been to the TensorFlow meetup, this is a very quick rundown. Uh, I have a kind of background in machine intelligence, startups, finance. Um, I moved from New York City to Singapore in 2013. 2014, I just spent um, doing open source stuff, reading papers, playing with robots and drones. Um, but then since 2015, I've been doing this kind of serious uh, AI thing um, with a local company, Natural Language Processing, Deep Learning. Um, with Sam, we've been running a, a developer course um, whilst doing Red Dragon AI. Um, we've also had um, the opportunity to publish papers. We've had something at NIPS. Um, so we're, that's really moving somewhere, so that's good. Um, Red Dragon, this is a slide which Sam has probably had. Uh, we've been doing deep learning, consulting, prototyping. Um, we're also doing education and training. I can, I've got a, like an ad slide at the end. Uh, we're interested in conversational computing, by which we mean actual natural voices output and also listening, and also how to interact these things with a knowledge base. Um, so if you've ever had a conversation with a Google Home, you'll know it's kind of a limited, even though Google Home is kind of king of the assistants, it's kind of limited. You can't talk for more than like a sentence or two. We think there's a lot more to do in that. So learning to learn to learn. I'm, I'm going to talk about the very basic ideas of learning, um, how to learn from a lot of data, how to learn from some data, and how you would learn from just a little bit of data. Uh, now, how many people have seen this TensorFlow playground? It's quite a lot, because this is kind of a go-to thing. So um, if you haven't seen it, this is, I'm going to just do this very quickly. It'd be even better if it really works. Sorry. Okay. So basically, this is a, let me just set it up, okay. So this is a very simple uh, playground which Google put together to show people about how the basics of neural networks work. And I'm just going to show you the very simple steps, like first steps, so you can understand what I'm talking about with machine learning. So over on the left-hand side, this is my data set. And basically, the data here is a bunch of orange points and a bunch of blue points. And what I want to do is train a model to say, is this, are these, is this area meant to be blue or is this meant, area meant to be orange? And you see at the, mo at the moment, by using these two features, which are lefty and righty and uppy and downy, it's actually made a model which is almost entirely wrong, right? It's saying that this area should be orange and this area should be blue. This is incorrect. So what these models do is, because it's making a, an incorrect assumption, I'm now going to try and penalize it for having the wrong answer. And how is it coming to this answer? It's by adding up these inputs. You can probably, yes, you can see the line here. It's adding up in, like a contribution from this one and a contribution from this one, but it's getting the wrong answer. So the way in which you would fix it up is decide, well, which one of these is, is to blame for me getting the wrong answer? And I can work out how, how much it is to blame just by looking at mathematically or be the derivative of my badness. But basically, I'm assessing my badness, figuring out who to blame, and then adjusting the weighting to that particular thing. So if I do that repeatedly, um, so I'm going to look at how bad my model is, I'm going to assign blame, adjust the weights, change, and then do the whole cycle again, I will learn very quickly how to make a nice model. So this is essentially the badness of my model has gone from some pretty bad model to like zero badness very quickly because here it's now correctly set assigning this is the blue area, this is the orange area. So we could just, re we could just re so we, every time I kind of restart this, it's coming up with a, a random initial model. So here's it randomly pretty, pa pretty bad. I can now do a retraining there. See, the model has learnt the difference between the blue points and the orange points 
pretty easily. Now suppose I go for a slightly different um, thing, and let me just get something flat here again. So here you can see that we've got a checkerboard kind of pattern. And you've got some orange points, some blue points in a checkerboard. Now how many people, well, rather than put you on the spot, I'm going to claim that you can't do this with one line. And it should be fairly obvious that this, if I train this model with mixing the, these two things together just with one pair of um, weights, essentially, I can't ever get anything which will match this up. But if I start to add like more, like combining them in different ways, let's try this one. What it'll do is it'll now, ooh, it's com combining, it's trying to combine a little corner up here and a little corner down there into something which will at least classify two of these properly. Let's, let's try this again. Okay, here's another way of doing it. So this is trying to put kind of like the best fit two lines um, to fit as much of the data as it can, but it still hasn't got the right idea. But if I actually start to add, um, if I add more, more units here to produce more intermediate results, it might start doing a better job. But this isn't a great job in that it's really now, it's now used these three lines you can see a line here, a line here, a line here, to kind of approximate what's going on, but it doesn't really understand that this is a cross. And the way, the way in which I might encourage it is by adding another hidden layer. And say, well, what if I did this using the three things? Oh, now, now, now this has got a better understanding of the data. Because it started to essentially pick out that I want features which can carve off this piece and this piece to make a nice answer. So in some sense, this is a model which um, is much closer to how a human would look at this problem. But the interesting thing that this has done is, in order to do this, I've added these intermediate steps. And this blame game, saying, well, do I, if I make a mistake, do I blame this one? Or if this one's making a mistake, do I go back? This is called backpropagation. So this is kind of how errors can flow through from a model which would initially be bad, Okay. Dun, dun, dun. and then gradually would come into focus hopefully it will figure out it may, it may have actually got stuck here okay. let's do it again that was, that was a stuckage Ooh, ah. okay. so you can see that if I, you, but you can imagine that if I were to make this more complicated I could get it to fit better um, on the other hand, if I go for something like even more complicated, like this is a, the donut shape, maybe this model is sufficient to figure it out. Maybe not. Oh, okay. So, so this is this. You can see it by having a deeper and/or wider model, I can now fit the data better. And this is a, a very nice example from Google. Um, we can let's go for an even more complicated example. Let's go for spirals. Okay. Now, if I just leave this training for a bit, it's going to make some attempt to make this into spirals. But the problem is, it doesn't understand the concept of spiral. Right? It has no I. My five-year-old could solve this pretty quickly. Um, just tell her that there are two spirals. Now, 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 draw some color of this in orange and blue. Um, this is now going to try and fit as best it can, and gradually it will try and wrap around these things. It probably hasn't got enough um, like potential. Let, let's just add some more stuff. Da -da -da. Maybe. Okay. So, so now with this is a much bigger model. Um, my guess is with this kind of, you know, now it's getting bigger. There's some chance it will get there, but it's going to get there much slower because there's a lot of detail which it's going to kind of sort through. And it might start getting stuck in that it's, it's here it's, it's worked out that this sector has a lot of blues in, I don't know, because they've got this unfortunate gap here, right? It doesn't understand that that's a gap in the spiral. It just thinks, here's some data, there's some data missing, here's some other data. And gradually this is filling out a picture of how to build this thing, but it doesn't understand that this is spirals. It has no concept of that. Oh. Oh, this is kind of entertaining. But this is a typical neural network training. So here we've only got, um, I got six and five and five. So we've got 16 neurons. You'll have some hundred weights or something. Um, 
and you can see it's kind of it's kind of now solving it pretty well. I guess this orange area it's not doing so well across here, but it'll now. And this is the training curve. Now it's kind of got stuck. There we go. So this is a thing which is now kind of learnt. And so my statement here is okay. What we've the goal of this was to learn how to predict the the regions. We've got the input features. We know what a single neuron can learn, which is just like a straight line. I've described this kind of blame game, and then how these deep neural networks can create features that they need. So this is where you have seen, or you have learnt, how to learn. Okay? So this is the, the very basics of how all these models work. So let's go for something a bit more, like a bigger, a bigger idea. Um, there's a big image competition called ImageNet, which has been going since the early 2000s, I think, um, where they have 15 million images in 22,000 categories. And this has been an, on an ongoing competition for machine vision people. And what used to happen in the 2000s is that people would write papers on how I wrote an eye detector or how I wrote a fur detector or how I can detect metal in images. There would be particular things that people would write papers about in, ha in how to actually identify these things because it was a very low-level feature creation exercise. That was the kind of the academic game. How do I create features or recognize these features? The point of these neural networks is they can actually develop the features that they want just by giving it images and classes and saying, just learn this thing. So this is uh, Google Net. This is a Google network from 2014. So suddenly we've now got quite a lot of layers. Um, this is pretty heavily hand-engineered by Googlers. Um, and achieves you know, excellent results at the time, which essentially completely wiping away. You know, by, this, by this stage, the um, deep learning things have just taken over because in, instead of writing a paper of all the different feature detectors you figured out, you just say, we have a network which is shaped like this and we trained it on data. That then moves on to like 2015. Now we've got a, a more complicated network from Google. Um, and there's essentially we can draw a curve of these things over time. So this is going from his early days to recent times. Before 2012, um, this is what people were doing with their kind of feature detector papers. Um, 2012, Alex, or some, some guy with a GPU in his bedroom, came along and he figured out, yes, we can train this whole thing end to end. And apparently at the computer vision conference, most people didn't even know what these networks could do, um, and he could you know, suddenly beat them by a huge, huge margin. And so as time goes on, these, these networks are getting better and better, and the number of layers is going up and up. This is a Microsoft um, contribution. Um, human performance is about 5%, so this is superhuman performance, and this is now three years ago, two years ago. So, um, so now, basically, the, this ImageNet competition has been abandoned. Um, because these things have got better than groups of people. Um, so now it's moved on to let's do it for video, let's do it for other things, or let's do it on super small images, um, just because these machines have got, like, too good. Um, so what we can also do is, so, so what we've done here is we've got an image net, which is trained from zero. So you train this from just like the spiral detector or you know, the donut detector. We've, tra we've started this with just random weights, we use huge numbers of images and huge computational resources, and this is going to do exactly what we told it to. It's going to, if you put in an image, it's going to tell you the class, one of a thousand. So next trick we could do is we could actually do a thing called transfer learning. We could take an existing model, pre-trained on ImageNet, for instance, and then use that model to learn new classes. So this is stuff which aren't in the thousand classes. Let's use stuff which are you know, novel to it. Um, hopefully, we can do this by using fewer examples than millions of images. Okay. And so I can do a little demo of this. Um, we kind of at the... Oh, okay, it's not, not even here. So I, I've got a repo online which has got all of this stuff in. So all these notebooks are right there. Transfer learning and Keras. Okay, I, I, okay well, I can rerun it, but let's, let's not. So basically, I have limited time today. So I'm going to take a pre-trained network, 
and I'm going to load up Keras, which is our kind of go-to high-level thing. And then from Keras, well, actually, Keras has a model zoo. And the model zoo includes all of these different models, or many of these different models. And this is one of the very early models, this VGG model. And this has hundreds of millions of parameters, and it scores in the 70s in terms of performance. But as time went on, you know, this Inception V3, which is a 2015 one, has got many fewer, mod many fewer parameters and much better performance. So gradually, as time progresses, it's kind of like an efficient frontier in financial terms of models, which are either better in terms of performance for the same number of parameters or lower parameters of the same performance. And currently, the, the, the efficient barrier here is things called NASNet. So I'm just going to load up one of those. Um, which has, you know, includes all this structure. Um, I can do this in one line here, this NASNet mobile. I just load that thing in. There's, there's the model. I have a couple of kind of um, image to input. So this is kind of pre-processing. I can then just train it on, or sorry, I can then look at the results for a single image on my disk, OK? So this is, its votes are for 67% tabby cat, OK? So this is something which, you, you too could pull this model out of my repo, have a look at images on your disk, um, and it would do good things, okay? And you could even put them in an images directory and then get a whole bunch of different images, okay? So this, the, this is the I hate you Siamese cat. Um, this is the disappointed owl, I guess. It, it doesn't have Arctic, it doesn't have snowy owl as one of its training examples or, or as one of its classes. So it has no concept of what this owl is. It's, it's some, it's, oh, clearly it thinks it's a fox um, and other things which might be white um, or golf ball or, or some stuff. So this is clearly this is outside its scope. Um, the, the Shiba Inu is in closer, but actually no cigar. It's not in the training set. Um, here's the tabby cat again. Okay. So this is essentially using many, many examples, um, and it's doing exactly what we told it to, but it's actually doing it kind of... In particular, these, these ones are wrong, right? They, because it can't be right. So let's do something called transfer learning. So this is where we can use a limited sample of our own data to get actual proper good answers out of this. And so what we'll do is we'll take the, this ImageNet network where I've got an input image and I put it through a CNN to, and I get these um, kind of probability or logits. But instead of using this best of, you know, which one is the most likely, I'm going to replace it with an SVM. So this is a standard um, psychic learn kind of SVM. And so what I'm going to do is the, the reason for doing this is because when it makes an error, it will make the same kind of error for the same kind of objects because this thing kind of understands images in general, and the pattern of errors is actually indicative of the true uh, of indicative of the class. So let me show what that looks like. Um, some more kind of helper functions. I'm going to use a bunch of classic and modern cars. So I've got a, a bunch of these cars on disk, and they look like this. So this would be a classic sports car. Here's another classic sports car, another classic sports car. So I've got, I've got 10 classic sports cars on disk, and I've got 10 modern sports cars. Okay? So the modern sports cars are clearly different um, to a human. On the other hand, these are not part of the training set for ImageNet. It doesn't know about sports cars in general. Um, so what I'm going to do is what this does is it goes through each of these images and runs it through ImageNet up to the pattern of errors it will make. So it can't possibly get the right class, but the pattern of, of you know, bad guesses it makes will be different between the modern cars and the classic cars. So in particular, it may be that it thinks that this looks like a lotus leaf or lotus seed pod or something. Whereas if you look at the classic cars, these things look more like, this is a very good one, but th these things look more like plates. So th these are classes within ImageNet, which it will identify this as being, this one is pretty platy, and the other one's pretty lotusy. The fact that it, there's some difference there, I should be able to pick up with an SVM. So having put in these, essentially 10 of each, 
I can then essentially train a linear SVC or whatever. This trains within you know, half a second, okay? It's only got 20 examples to train from, each of which has got a, thousand, a vector of a thousand things. And I can then go through and classify a test set. So this is now reading through a directory of test images, which it's never seen before, and it's running this through the same ImageNet network and seeing what kind of errors it makes. That is then put into a classifier, which is just an SVM, and says, okay, this is a modern sports car, this is a classic sports car. So this trained within half a second, okay? So we're leveraging Google's um, 62,000 GPU hours, or whatever, and we're using it, we can train this in half a second on our own classes. Um, so it's making good guesses so far. Prius, well, it's only got two options here. It's not exactly a sports car. Um, and it's got the classic ones. This one is misclassified for some reason. Okay. So it's not perfect. On the other hand, image and it's also not perfect. But um, this is kind of an example of how we can use very limited data. And it could be class class classifying kind of e-commerce images or all sorts of things. I'm going to use an existing pre-trained network and then fake it into training on our stuff. So, so that was that was a, so let's just okay okay so let's just talk about this. So next level learning. So let me just recap. Okay, so train from zero was the plain image net um, transfer learning. We took an existing model and then we kind of leveraged the exist the, that to train on the existing classes. Okay. So next level learning. So the problem with the previous methods is we had to learn from a very large amount of data, but humans can learn from very little data indeed. Um, what we'd like to do is have models which could also learn from very, very little data. Ideally, we'd want the models to learn how to learn. So we don't just want them to be taught, we want them to be, be willing students or already students. So there are two main types of meta learning. Sorry, image is turned down. So this is called meta learning. So there are two main types of meta learning. What we want, one is to learn how to build the very best model, which is called structure meta learning. So this is we're trying to make a very good model which is willing to learn what we're going to teach it. Another way is to build a model which is ready to learn as quickly as possible. So it's just it's kind of on a nice edge so that it will learn every example you give it very, very quickly. So this is kind of two directions which this has taken. So for the structure metal learning, the issue is that it's very difficult for humans to build models. So it took Google a long, long time to build their Google Annet or their inception. It's kind of lots of graduate students. It's called you know, stochastic graduate descent or whatever. Um, but what we want to do is we want to give the, the computers the ability to build models. And we do that by enabling them to search through all the different architectures efficiently and then also being able to predict which is the most which is the most if we're increasing the volume for no reason so what we want to do is, is once we train them we want them to then predict what would be a good architecture and then kind of do it like a game so it has some bad networks getting better getting better and now it wants, it wants to be able to predict where would the next good network come from let's create the structure now, the nice thing about this
witness to them any old character, you know, any character. The whole time is a model that can learn from just a few examples or from just one example. One few examples, one example. So there's a nice data set which we've come up with, which consists of 1623 handwritten characters from 50 different alphabets. So not only have you got kind of the, the Latin alphabets, but you've got Greek and, you know, all these other ones. But the key thing they've got in common is that they're all drawn by hand by someone, right? Or, or by, I think it's 20 different people. So th they've got quite a lot of commonality in that they've been drawn as strokes, right? If I can have a network which learns what strokes are common, then that would then be primed to learn stuff quickly. So then, one more time on the Omnigot logic. So we've got 1623 characters, each drawn by just 20 people. Contrast this with MNIST, which was 10 characters drawn 5,000 times each. So each, what we have here, I've got a little demo, and you, can, you could play this at home kind of thing. Um, each, this is a one-shot classification. Each task will train on one example for three of three different classes. Um, it runs in JavaScript using, I think, tensorflow.js, um, and it shows that what this meta, meta task is. And so it's hands on. You, you could actually do it on your phones, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. So here we go. It will look something, it should look something like this. So if, so it may be that I could draw some, like I'll draw A. So this is one, one example. I can draw a B. Draw C, okay, and so here I'm going to say, well, let's draw there. Okay, so it thinks I'm starting a C, which is probably right actually. What happens if I do this? Oh, now it's convinced it's going to be okay. What happens if I do this? Ooh, we're getting less confident. Oh, now I think it's on a B. Okay, so th this model has so I've given all the training data. This is this is examples of the three classes. This model is set up to learn these classes as quickly as possible. And it can now learn essentially one-shot learning. So suppose I do this. Oh, A. OK. <laughs> right, so it, it, yes, it's all clear. OK, so we, we, could, we can play this game again and again. So this is a, this is a, oh, that's not very good, is it? Let's try, <laughs> let's draw a cat. There we go. There's a cat, and there's a mouse, and there's a house. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, if if I draw an ear, oh, ooh, that's not right. What about another ear? Oh, I think he likes the mouse, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So the ma okay, the cat's mouth is something which gives it away. So there we go. Or what if I if draw a house? So if you go online, there, house, okay. So if you go online, there's at redcatlabs.com slash meta. You can just play with this yourself. No, no need to listen to the rest. Um, okay, oh, I've got a tensor. I do have a TensorFlow t-shirt. So this is the TensorFlow content. Um, as, as you've heard, the, the recent TensorFlow summit pays, this pays the bills. So I need to go through this. Um, I'm not going to mention PyTorch on this slide. So TensorFlow eager mode gives you tons of quick development benefits, which researchers love, <coughs> tools which do that, right? But the, one of the benefits of TensorFlow is that it's kind of production ready, because it has this whole story about being from your model that you build, you can then move it to TensorFlow serving, you can do all this distributed stuff, you can also move it down to your mobile phone, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff that TensorFlow does. And, you know, and the TPU thing, which is kind of like awesome hardware, which maybe we might get to use one day. Um, so at the summit, they all announced this thing called TensorFlow Eager Mode, which essentially enables you to use t TensorFlow in a very similar method that you might use other packages. Um, and there's a nice video online. Um, and I've got a little, little example here um, with this reptile signs thing. So basically, I went through this, um, and instead of this other package, um, 
instead of this one, I just replaced it with you know, the TensorFlow eager or the TensorFlow way of doing this. And so for each line, I've taken out this, whatever this is, and replaced it with a Keras model. Okay? And essentially, this, I'm replacing it you know, line by line. I'm doing exactly what you, you might do in your you know, research quality or prototype quality code, and I'm doing it in proper TensorFlow here. Um, so you can see that also Keras also will give me the nice model description. Keras will also give me TensorBoard interface, all this kind of thing. Um, and you know, it required a little bit of fiddling around because you know, there's, some, there's some mechanics which they do to make this work, but the same thing can be done in TensorFlow quite easily. And then you can get similar kind of stuff happening. So this is, basically, this enables you to actually use TensorFlow not just as you kind of your production thing, but also as a kind of research tool. So we're kind of excited as to where this might go. Um, but it may be that sometimes we might use other tools. Who knows? So, OK. OK, so what you have learned, you've just seen how to make machines learn at all, right? So that was the TensorFlow playground. You've seen how they've learned from a lot of data, which was the image net. So now some data, which was the transfer learning, and learn from a little data. And this is the learning to learn thing. So you have learned to learn to learn. Okay. In doing this, I've been learning how to teach you how to learn to learn. And now you've understood, you've learned how I've learned how to, to make you learn to learn. Okay. That's meta learning. So. One of the nice things, so this is wrap up, the field is advancing extremely rapidly. Um, lots of stuff is coming out like day to day. Um, it's still kind of within the grasp of individuals, just me and my laptop or me and my NVIDIA card, we can do stuff which is like up to date, cutting edge research. So something from Uber came out like two days ago. It's lots of MNIST results. You can still see very interesting things about MNIST. Um, of course, people with huge hardware, they can, they can do huger things, but uh, still uh, there's room for the gentleman or lady scientist to do this at home. Um, and the other thing is there's open source. The open source kind of applies to research too. All of these machine learning things are on a, a site called ArchiveX. You can read new papers every day that people are publishing code within three days. Um, it's not like you have to wait for it to appear in your university library. It's all right there. There's even there's so much of it that there's a tool called ArchiveX Sanity to just make it so that um, you only have a sane amount or less insane amount of stuff to deal with. So there's a ton of really interesting things and people, I would encourage people to write blog posts, give talks, do this stuff because it's quite easy to move into the actual doing something category and it's uh, an excellent thing to do. So thank you very much. Oh, before, before. So I should mention we've got a deep learning meetup group. The next meet, I'm not sure 17th is accurate now. Sometime, OK, sometime we're going to have a meetup in May. We've been holding one regularly like so at Google every month. And so that's one of the good things. A lot of people turn up to that. It's now one of the largest TensorFlow groups in the world, which is amazing for Singapore. Um, and we have stuff for beginners, stuff from the bleeding edge, and kind of lightning talks as well. And whoever kind of wants to talk, they can talk. Um, we've also run this a jumpstart thing, which is now we've just done our first batch of these. We'll probably do more batches of these. It's to make people actually do a project rather than just listen to stuff. And then by tomorrow, well, it kind of starts slipping away. If you actually do it, um, there's a big benefit, we, we believe. So this basically, we get people to do a project over a week, and it forces them to bang their head against a wall, for instance, which is a good learning experience. Um, and then they'll have built something for themselves. Um, we also, last year, this is, so this is a 2017 thing, so this is not now. We did an eight-week developer course. So this is kind of hardcore. Um, probably too much information for eight weeks. Right? Um, we will probably do something similar upcoming. So we're trying to figure out the format also with funding sources for Singaporeans because we want to make sure that Singaporeans can take these because we like that. So, um, but that's also going to be kind of intensive. Um, 
it may be that the first module of that is the jumpstart course itself. So you can start this up, and then there's, there's a lot further to go after that. OK. Questions? Any question about anything within reason? Since you have the code from the other package in the TensorFlow, could you learn to learn to learn that to translate? Oh, like a sequence to sequence model between the two things. Oh, that would be good, except we'd need to make sure that the Google code worked, right? So you could also automatically generate bug reports. That might be a good thing. But yes, it's, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of interesting kind of learn-to-learn things. And also, the open source, like the Linux kernel and stuff, provides a huge resource of known good code or known interesting code. So you can play all these kinds of games. Very, there's lots of interesting things to do. Who's next? OK. Well, then Alan should start up. Anyone else? No, I think you're asking for next question. Yes, yes, yes. Well, let's switch over to the laptops first. Okay. And this is a little panel for that guy. Yeah. 